Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone here. A few of you sweet folks out there might have had a little trouble with the rain. I hope you didn't melt too much on the way in. Well, you might know you didn't have any problem melting, so you just we know you're okay. <laughs> the rest of you, maybe not so much. Uh, we are continuing our summer series uh, this Wednesday. We're real happy to have Aaron Pope with us. He really doesn't need an introduction here, we know, but he is uh, coming to us from uh, Liberty Hill Church of Christ in Inglewood, Tennessee. We're thankful that uh, he's able to be here with us and brought a couple of his kids with him that I think probably was a little, little bitty last time Last time most of y'all saw him, so that's, uh, boy, time flies. But we don't have uh, really much else to say. We're thankful that Aaron's here. We're doing our series on taking a lesson that you've heard before and redoing that lesson for us, and he's going to do that. So if you'll bow with me for a word of prayer, we'll uh, have an opening prayer, and then we'll turn the service over to, to Aaron. Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this day that you've blessed us with. Father, we thank you for the rain that's outside and for the, the sunshine that we've also been able to enjoy recently. We're thankful for all the, the beauty and the wonders of the world that you have given us to enjoy and also, Father, to take care of. We're so thankful for your word and for the instruction that it gives us to, to tell us how to please you and ultimately, Father, how to, to make our way to heaven and to, to help others make that same way. Father, we're thankful for, for Aaron and for the studies that he's put in. We pray that you will bless him tonight as he breaks into us the bread of life, that he will do a, an excellent job and we will leave here being encouraged and strengthened and that we will go out to serve you. Father, please forgive us when we fail you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. It is good to see all your faces and uh, so many that, that I know so well and have, uh, have loved for so long. Many that, a few that I've just met for the first time tonight. I'm thankful to have met you and, and thankful that you're here at the Lafayette Church of Christ and glad that you're here to, to study the Word of God. I know that this has been a, a great series that you guys have, uh, have experienced this, this summer and uh, I know I know the men, some of the men who have been here and know some of the topics that they were preaching on and know that they've done a great job. You've been edified and enriched and built up because of that. But I'm I'm thankful that tonight is my night to be able to be at Lafayette. Uh, as, as Jesse said, uh, to, to a lot of you, the, I, I'm not a stranger at all. Uh, we spent we spent quite a bit of time here at Lafayette and. Uh, a lot of great things happened when we were living here and working here, and this is a place that I look at with great fondness. And I became a, I became a better man and a better husband and a better preacher, and I learned to be a, a dad in a lot of ways here. And and uh, you always encouraged me and helped me and and helped me grow and to get to the point that I am now. And and I'm thankful for you and love you for it. And so many great associations that that I have because of this place. And so I'm thankful for you and, and thankful that God's blessed us to be able to be again, be together again like this on this Wednesday night. Uh, very quickly, I'll just say I did bring two of my children with me, uh, Oliver and Mamie Lou. Uh, they're my two oldest, 16 and 15 now. Wendy was not able to make it. She uh, had a last second work uh, assignment that came her way. And so she ended up doing something she didn't really want to do, but that's where she's at. And the other children are with, uh, with Wendy's parents. So we are, we're, we hate that they weren't able to come, but that, that we were able to be here with you. I'm, I love the fact that this summer series is based around lessons from those who've come before us, those great preachers who have, have helped build our faith and have helped to build the kingdom of God into what it is today. And, and I was uh, interested when I saw that group text that popped up and, and I started seeing the other men start putting in the topics that they wanted to cover and the sermons they wanted to cover. And I, I would see one come up and I'd go, boy, that's a great one. And I'd see another, boy, that's a good one too. And, and uh, I was thankful that in the list that Curry sent us that that one name popped out, and that was the name of Brother Wendell Winkler. And I, I can remember as a child hearing a lot of, of, of fine gospel preachers. I had a, had a great blessing to be surrounded by gospel preachers and to, 
to know them and to, to hear them and, and even remember much of, a lot of sermons that I heard as a young person, a very young person. But I, re, I remember hearing Brother Winkler preach at a gospel meeting down in Mississippi. And uh, I think I, at that time I was about six years old when I heard that sermon. And uh, he was one of those men that as I listened to him, I could tell that he knew what he was talking about, one. And I can remember that, that a lot of preachers didn't keep my attention very long, except for my dad. I had to listen to my dad. If I didn't, I was in trouble. But Brother Winkler was able to keep your attention. And he, he was always uh, very clear in what he had to say, very straightforward, uh, but, but also very kind and gentle and loving. And then some years later, I was able to hear his son Dan preach. And I, I'm, I'm not for sure... Uh, if this is the case or not, but I, my, my memory says that the sermon that I heard his father preach first, that I heard a variation of that sermon from his son when I heard him preach. And Brother Dan Winkler is a man that I know that, that many of you know of and, and have heard him speak and preach, and he's a, he's a wonderful man and a great preacher. So I'm thankful tonight to be able to, uh, to preach a sermon that uh, I've heard uh, a couple of times from those where it originated from and also been able to, to make it my own. In fact, I'll, I'll end this introduction by saying, I believe, I know that on Sunday night, the night that I tried out the Fed, I preached on Romans chapter 10. And I'm almost certain that the sermon I'm going to preach tonight is the sermon that I preached in my first, the tryout here at the Fed. So I'm thankful to be able to cover that material. Preaching the way it ought to be. Now I think about the importance of preaching. The importance of, of having those who would stand and teach, who would, who would be educated and learned and, and dedicated to knowing the Word of God and to be able to communicate that in a clear way. And I can't think of many things outside of, of great elders that is more important in the Lord's church than men who will stand and preach the gospel. And when we think about preachers and think about their importance, we know that the Bible is very clear that preaching is central to, to God's people, to, uh, to God's people telling others about the saving message of the gospel. In fact, when you look at the when you look at the the conversion stories that we find in the book of Acts, you're going to find always that there is a man who is with another man or human being, we'll, we'll say human being, that, that is telling that other person about God, who's telling them about the gospel of Jesus. I suppose, and I have no doubt, that there are some who might have picked up the Word of God and read it and studied it themselves, and, and in doing so, they learned the truth and they obeyed the gospel by that method. But when I look at the New Testament, what I see is that there are men who are standing and preaching and teaching the gospel, and that is how people are saved. That is how they come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, I am confident and, uh, and sure that it is God's plan that, that men be taught. I don't know about you, but I was taught by someone. I was taught by by many people, my family, my mother and father beginning, and then others who, who taught me and mentored me and, and, and showed me the gospel, and, and because of that I obeyed it. We are meant to be those who, who are told the gospel and meant to be those who stand and teach the gospel. You remember in John 6 when Jesus was talking to a group of people and it was, it was their question to Him about what He was going to do next. Remember they'd been on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and they had eaten that great meal that Jesus had prepared and fed the 5,000. And they began to ask Jesus questions and, and Jesus didn't give them the answers they wanted. But one of the things that He told them was that the only way that someone could know is if God showed them and the only way that God would show them is if they were taught and if they learned of Jesus. That's John 6, 44 and 45. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man 
hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Jesus says that if, a, if someone is going to learn about God, it's going to be because someone has taken the time to teach them, to preach to them. We all know Romans chapter 10. We know that chapter so well. It is there that Paul is giving the defense of the gospel to, to his uh, Jewish brethren. And you remember verse 13 where Paul says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he begins to ask a, 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 a list of rhetorical questions. He says, How then shall they call on him of whom they have not uh, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Paul said that preaching was essential for those who would believe in Jesus and would follow him and obey his gospel and would be faithful to him. How shall they hear without a preacher? Those are important words. You know, we could look at other, other times that, that, that Paul specifically had talked about the importance of preaching. He did so in his letters to Timothy in First and Second Timothy. He did so to the young man Titus as, as he talked to, talked to him in that letter about all the things that he was to pay attention to. Preaching, preaching is essential. It's essential. Good preaching is even more essential. There's a way to preach and there's a way not to preach. And, and I want to say this humbly. I don't want to, to sound as if I've got it all figured out and that, that somehow I, I, I've, I've got the formula and no one else does. That's not the point at all. But there's a difference between preaching and good preaching. We have some young men at Liberty Hill that they preach every fifth Sunday. And that's one of the things I've tried to impress upon them. That you can you can get up and you can and you can say something. Anyone can get up and say something. But you need to be able to get up and say something that's meaningful, something that matters. And do it in the way that that is uh, what the Bible says to do. So good preaching is something that's vital. And, and I don't know what your experience is, what you've seen, what you've heard as, as your life has, has gone on, but I know that I've seen, I've seen a shift in the way that men preach and how they preach. I know that I've learned so much about preaching. I, I appreciate the fact that there are many of you who gave me grace and were able to, to sometimes when maybe, uh, you know, as a preacher, you're always trying to hit a home run, and sometimes I did hit a home run. But I'm thankful that you always encouraged me, even though the times that maybe I did preach a stinker here or there. You know, that, that's how it goes. But I've seen a shift in the way that men preach. That that we, in a lot of ways, in a lot of places, not every place. I can't indict all, but in a lot of places, we've moved away from from being straightforward Bible preachers. That now we've become psychologists and we've become sociologists and we've become all kinds of different things other than those who stand up and preach the pure Word of God in its simplicity and in its truth. And we need men, if we're going to, to be what God wants us to be, if, if the church is going to flourish as it, as it has, we need men who will stand up and preach in that same manner once again. So, how ought we to preach? Again, I, I don't have the formula that's in and of myself. But there is there are many places in the in the New Testament that we could find a good pattern of preaching. But I don't believe that we can find one that is any better illustrated than a chapter that we're all so familiar with. We've studied it backwards and sideways and frontwards and every way that you could probably turn it. But if you'll turn over to Acts chapter two with me, I want to I want us to take notice of uh, of this sermon that we have studied so diligently over the years. And I want us to think about the, the blueprint for preaching the way that it ought to be found in what we call this first gospel sermon. This is the first sermon that was preached in, uh, where, where repentance and remission of sins was preached in the name of Jesus as Jesus predict, predicted in, in uh, Luke 24. 
as he told his disciples that it would be in Jerusalem that the gospel would first be preached. And here it is, as we know it was the day of Pentecost, and it, they were waiting on the Spirit to fall upon them as Jesus had promised. They were waiting on that day to, to come, and, and, and we're going to see this man Peter stand up and begin to preach. And, and we're going to be able to recognize the way that he preached and, and see that it is a biblical way for us to preach, preaching the way it ought to be. Before we get into chapter 2, I'd like you just to back up to Acts chapter 1, where Luke, the great historian, has told us about the days that led up to the day of Pentecost. And I want you to notice that as, uh, as Jesus had talked to them, He had ascended into heaven, and now they were waiting together in Jerusalem. They returned there. They were waiting in Jerusalem. In verse 14, Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, I want you to take note of what Luke says was going on amongst the disciples, understanding that this man Peter and, we sometimes forget that on the day of Pentecost, Peter and the rest of the disciples or the apostles were there. It wasn't just Peter, we're just spotlight on Peter in Acts 2. But notice in verse 14, the Bible says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Could I suggest to you in the first place that preaching the way that it ought to be begins with preachers who pray. We need men who, who base their life around prayer, about around relying upon God, relying upon their Heavenly Father to be able to know and to, and to have wisdom and to be able to have courage and to be able to have boldness to stand and preach the Gospel. You think about the the setting that we find here in Jerusalem. They've just seen Jesus taken away from them. They've seen Him beaten and scourged. And they've seen Him hung upon the cross to die. And now they've met Him, the risen Savior. And He's told them that He's ascending and He has to go away to the Father. But He's there to wait for power on high. And, and that He's going to come back in the same way the angel said He'll come back in the same way that He's left. And here they are, they're waiting on, on Jesus. They know that something is about to happen, something that is momentous. And the Bible tells us that they're waiting for that to happen. And while waiting, they're praying. Bible-loving men who preach God's Word are praying men. You go all the way back to the Old Testament, and just for time's sake, there may be some passages that I do not read or quote. When you go back to the Old Testament, you begin to read about the prophets and the men who, who did the will of God in, in that day. You think about the great scribe, Ezra. I don't know if there's a greater man that we'll read about in the Old Testament than Ezra. But Ezra was, was the one who was to teach the law again to the children of Israel. They'd been, been gone from in captivity for 70 years. You remember that, that Cyrus allowed them to go back and begin to rebuild the temple. That was the job of Zerubbabel. Remember, Nehemiah was the man that was to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And Ezra was the man that was to teach the law again to, to those who, to whom it had been lost on. And there in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 1, we're going to see, we see that Ezra, he repented and he prayed to God. He made sure that, that his intention was pure, that his heart was pure, and then he prayed that God would help him in the work that he was about to do. The great prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 32, he prayed in verse 16 and in verse 26, we see these words that are simple but profound, and the word of the Lord came to him. I think about Habakkuk, the great prophet towards Judah, as he struggled with why God will allow the Babylonians to come in and take the people away, this unrighteous people to come and take the righteous away. And it's there that Habakkuk prays to God before he begins to prophesy to Israel. Habakkuk 3 and verse 1. Men who preach the gospel need to be praying men. What did Jesus do? So many times when he, would, when he was out and about with the people, he, the Gospels would tell us that He would go to a place, a solitary place, and what would He do? He would pray. Think about men that I've known in my life 
men that I want to be like. I hope that one day that I can stand before God and I can say that I emulated them the way that they emulated Christ. Men that I know loved prayer and they believed that prayer made a difference and they leaned upon their Father, they leaned upon their Savior, and, and they engaged in praying. I, I think I remember this quote from, from Brother Winkler attempting to do God's work without asking for God's help is not attempting to work at all in the kingdom. We need to have men who are praying men if we're going to preach the way God wants us to. Secondly, look over there in Acts chapter 2 as we move forward. Secondly, I'd like for you to consider that if we are going to preach the way that we ought to preach, that we need to be people who have a constant appeal to Scripture. A constant appeal to the Word of God. Notice in Acts chapter 2, there it is that, that the Spirit has fallen upon the apostles. They've begun to speak in tongues. Every man who is there for the Pentecost begins to hear in his own language and they're confused as to why it is that, that these unlearned Galileans are speaking and they can understand them. And, and they come up with all kinds of uh, different reasons. And, and, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But Peter begins to explain to them exactly what's happening. And the first time that he uses Scripture in this great sermon is, is, it begins there in verse 16 when he says, well, what you see going on, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he begins to quote or read or, uh, or quote from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. But that's not the only place that Peter's going to appeal to Scripture as he preaches this, this gospel sermon. He's going to use Joel 28 through 32 later on as he talks about David and, and, and David's, uh, David's prophecy of Christ. He quotes Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10. That's verses 25 through 28. Later on, further, as he's preaching and teaching this, this great lesson, after verse 35, he, from, I'm sorry, from verse. Uh, Verse uh, uh, 34 and 35, he quotes from Psalm 110 and verse 1. Over and over and over again, you see that, that Peter is going to look back to what Scripture says to prove that Jesus is who he says he is. I appreciate there's a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me. I know you don't believe it, but there are. There are people that are a lot smarter than me that are talented, talented speakers and that they, they know some things that I just don't know and they have a, an expertise in a certain field that I don't have an expertise in. And a lot of men are very good at taking that and marrying it together with, with what we find in Scripture and helping us to understand how that applies to us. And I'm appreciative of those men. I say that just to preface maybe what I'm about to say. Because I don't want to throw everyone into the same basket together. But in a lot of ways, we have men who preach today that they'd rather be psychologists. They'd rather be sociologists. They'd rather be legalists. They'd ra and when I say legalists, they'd rather be a lawyer. They'd rather be all kinds of different things. Good storytellers. Someone who's entertaining. Someone who sounds good. Someone who gives people what it is that they want to hear. Instead of being men, that they take the Word of God and they open it up and they plant their feet in the Scriptures, and they tell people about God from the only place that I will ever be able to know about God, the Scriptures. We need to be people who, as we preach, and, and, and we ought to demand that those who stand before us and preach the Word of, and preach the Gospel to us, that it is, it is a constant a, appeal to the Scriptures that is presented to us. Jesus, when He was tempted, I don't have to tell you what He did. What did He do? When, the, when Satan said, you're hungry, turn the stones into bread, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. He said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God when He said, cast yourself down off the temple. He said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. 
when He said, you can bow down before Me and have all the, all the worlds. Jesus Himself quoted from Deuteronomy when the devil encountered Him in the wilderness. Jesus appealed to Scripture over and over and over again. We need men who are men of the book. We need men who, who are men of the Scripture and they know the Scripture. And they're able to recount, recall those things and recount those things. When young people ask me what it is that they ought to preach on, I tell them, you have more material than you'll ever cover in your entire life in the book that you hold in your hand. Open it up, find something in there, and preach it. That's what you preach on. You don't need to have a fancy topic. You don't need to have the biggest words. You don't need to have some something that is profound to people or that it sounds profound. And I'm probably a little on a preaching soapbox, but we have too many people who are more interested in how people perceive that they sound rather than how they preach the Word of God before an Almighty God. We need to be people who we love the Word of God and we demand that it is preached and men who are going to preach. If you're not going to use this book, then you need to sit down and find something else to do. And that's about as plain as I can put it. The third place. I want you to take note that Peter was not afraid to set the record straight. He wasn't afraid to set the record straight. Remember that as they spoke in those other languages that every man could hear, one of, the, one of the theories that they came up with about these men speaking in other languages that they'd never been educated in, I always find this interesting when I read it, they said these men are full of new wine. They're, they, they're obviously drunk. They're full of new wine. But Peter was very quick to stand up and set the record straight. Look at verse 14 of Acts 2. But Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. He wasn't afraid to stand up and say, What you believe is going on is not what is going on. You're wrong about what you're saying. Now, in this case, it was simply it was looking at something that was miraculous and trying to uh, attribute it to something else. Really, it was a, without knowing, I would say, that many of these men, without knowing, it was blasphemy because they were saying that what God was doing, they were attributing it to something else. Now, they were doing it in ignorance, but doing it nonetheless. Peter stood up and said, this is not what is happening. This is not what, what the truth is. We need to be men as we preach the gospel. We need to be men who are not afraid to set the record straight. I believe it was Brother Guy Woods that accounted that within the pages of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that there are some 1,500 warnings that God has given to man about believing things that are wrong, about doing things that are wrong, worshiping wrong, 1,500 different times. Sometimes, not all the time, I don't believe that any preacher should stand up and his only goal is to take the, pick apart every other person who's ever preached the Gospel, who's pick apart every sermon he's ever heard, pick apart every philosophy he's ever heard, I don't believe that's his point. I don't believe it, that, that it should be his, his thrust that every sermon that he preaches is that he goes around and looks at every denomination and he brings, and he, and he brings the, the, the spotlight on each denomination every time that he preaches. I think back in the old days they called that hobby preaching. You get stuck on one thing and that's the only thing you preach on. That's not, that's not the point that we're making at all. But church, sometimes men have to stand before crowds of people, sometimes they have to get on Facebook or get on YouTube or some other internet medium, on television, on radio, in writing, 
sometimes men must stand and must set the record straight. What do you suppose would have happened in, in Galatia had Paul never began to, to talk about those Judaizing teachers that were forcing circumcision upon Christians saying, you can't be saved unless you're saved by the Jewish tradition of circumcision. What do you suppose would have happened there? I suppose they would have gone on believing the wrong thing. Remember what Paul said? He said, if anyone preaches another gospel, whether it is we or an angel, let him be accursed. You remember that, that Paul talked about even this man Peter that we are talking about tonight. That Peter was acting like a hypocrite. That is, he was acting as if he were a Jew with the Jews and with the and, and he was shunning the Gentiles. And, and, and Paul said that he withstood Peter to his face. The book of Thessalon first and second Thessalonians, obviously, there was a problem in Thessalonica where people were were shunning their work in the church. They were shunning even taking care of their own families. Some who even believed and were teaching that if, if you were dead already, that when Jesus was resurrected, that you had no hope, that you couldn't, you couldn't be, you couldn't have eternal life if you died before Jesus returned. And, and Paul addressed each one of those things. He set the record straight over and over and over again. Jesus set the record straight in Matthew 19. You remember they asked him whose wife the woman would be in the resurrection? And what did Jesus say? Don't you remember? Haven't you read that God made them male and female and He told them exactly what happened in the beginning when God joined Adam and Eve together and then gave them instructions on marriage? The woman at the well who was struggling with, with who was worshiping where and what was sanctioned by God when she looked at Mount Gerizim and she said, well, my father's worshiping this mountain. And Jesus said, well, there's a time coming when, when your fathers won't worship there and neither will they worship in Jerusalem. And He made the point when He said, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I could go on. But church, there's sometimes men need to stand up and they need to set the record straight. Because there are people who will preach after their own desires. There are men who will preach after their own wants. There are men who will preach just to keep a job because they're afraid they're going to get fired if they say the wrong thing. There are men who will preach because preach the wrong thing because they want to be popular. There are men who will preach the wrong thing because they want to be famous. And there are men who will preach the wrong thing just because they're too weak to preach the right thing. Sometimes, as uncomfortable as it may be, sometimes as hard as it may be, we have to stand up and we have to say, what you're saying is wrong. And even sometimes, I'm not saying that this is all the time, but sometimes we even have to talk very directly one to another in that engagement. We must be those who are willing to set the record straight. Fourthly, I'd like for you to notice that when Peter preached, when Peter preached the first gospel sermon, makes sense, doesn't it, that it was Christ-centered. It was Christ-centered. If you look at verse 22 of Acts chapter 2, look at how he begins after, after he's told them that what, what they thought was going on wasn't going on, but rather this was a prophet, a prophecy from the prophet Joel being fulfilled. In verse 22, he says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Listen, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by Him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. He said, we're not drunk, and this has been prophesied, and this is what's going on. And the very next words out of his mouth, he, be, he put forth his thesis for what he was about to say. I want you to pay attention, he said, in other words. I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say. Listen to these words. This is what I want to tell you about. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. What a wonderful way to start any gospel sermon. Let me tell you, you can't have the gospel without Christ, can you? It's not the gospel of Aaron. It's not the gospel of, of, of 
any Brother Winkler, it's not the gospel of anyone. The gospel that we preach is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And He is the center of all of it. I learned a hard lesson in my life in preaching. I can remember, boy, I want to preach some sermons sometimes. And I thought they sounded wonderful because you know, I, I was really smart and I could, I could make those sermons sound great and, 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 and convincing. And, and it sounded really good when I would practice those things. I remember preaching a sermon one night. I'm not going to say what I preached on, but I remember preaching a sermon one night and a good brother came to me and he said, you know, you're a good speaker, but you're a terrible preacher. And that was, for an arrogant 25-year-old, that was a punch in the gut. And the reason he said what he said is because I forgot what I was supposed to be preaching and how I was supposed to be preaching. I forgot that the, what I was preaching had to be Christ. We've lost our way somewhere where we're not preaching Christ and Him crucified and we're preaching all kinds of other things. We're getting lost in the weeds and we're not preaching Jesus. If I preach Jesus, I want you to think about this. If I preach Jesus, then I don't have to tell people, I don't have to try very hard to preach about the church that belongs to Christ. If I preach Jesus, I don't have to try very hard to preach the plan of salvation. If I preach Jesus, I'm not gonna, it's not going to be very hard for me to preach what the Bible says about marriage. If I preach Jesus, it's not going to be hard to tell people how God wants to be worshipped. If I preach Jesus, it's not going to be hard for me to, be the right, to tell people how to be the right kind of friend. It's not going to be hard for me to, how to, be, to tell people how to be the right kind of neighbor. It's not going to be hard to tell people what kind of speech they ought to use, how they ought to dress, where they ought to go, and who they ought to be with. Our sermons must be about Jesus. It, this book, this book from the very beginning to the very end is about Jesus the Christ. And how arrogant are we when we forget that and we decide that we know better than God and preach something other than Christ and Him crucified. In the fifth place, I'd like for you to notice that Peter's sermon had a definite conclusion. A definite conclusion. I preached more than once in my life and everyone in the audience was kind of wondering when I was going to get to where I was going and so did I. Sometimes we struggle to come to a definite conclusion to make sure that people understand what the point is that you're getting to, what you're saying. An older preacher that, that I looked up to for a long time in my life told me, he said, son, let me give you some good advice. I've been doing this for 60 years. He said, preach until you're done. But when you are done, stop preaching. <laughs> Get to the point. Make sure that what you're preaching has a point. And there, there is a conclusion to that. And we see Peter. What was his conclusion in this great sermon that we see in Acts chapter 2? Look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That is what he wanted them to know. You took him, you killed him, you crucified him, and now he is the Lord, he is Christ. And in essence, he said, what are you going to do about that? There must be a definite conclusion. People need to know what your point is. John, you read, you read in 1 John, do you think John wanted us to know that we could know? 22 times in 1 John, you're going to see you can, uh, things that we can know over and over and over again. We need to tell people how to fix the problems that they have, how to answer the questions that they're asking. We need to be able to reconcile differences that people have. We need to be people that offer solutions, not cause problems. We need to be people who know that we must come to a conclusion as we preach the gospel. Number six. I would like for you to notice that when we preach, that when we preach, that we must convict men of sin. Convict's a word we don't really like in the church because it sounds like something a, den a denominational person would use. 
But we're to convince. That's all the word convict is. We are to convince men that sin separates them from God. And the best preachers I've ever heard in my life, that's what they did. They convinced others that they were lost when they were lost. They convinced them that they were lost and men obeyed the Gospel because of it. And that is really our purpose, isn't it? And then to be able to, to, to keep those who are saved, to keep them from falling away, to convince others that sin separates from God. And that's exactly what Peter did as he preached this, this great sermon. And it's evident because you know verse 37 by heart, don't you? Now when they heard this, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, I'll say this, that the audience has a lot to do with whether or not you're convinced or not. We live in a different time than we have lived in the past in our lives. I can say that in my lifetime, I've seen people in years gone by much more receptive to the gospel. Much more receptive to, to, to hard preaching and accepting of hard preaching. But no matter what age we live in, no matter how men receive it or don't receive it, you know, the parable of the sower is not about the parable of the successful farmer. It's the parable of the sower, isn't it? God doesn't call us to be successful because once I begin to preach the gospel and I have preached the gospel and I've, and I've convinced or I have presented that sin separates man from God and Jesus is the only way to salvation and that, and, and that they can be saved by the plan of salvation, then I've done what God has asked me to do. I've been as successful as anyone can be. I don't have to keep up with how many people have obeyed the gospel when I preached or how many I baptized or, or whatever, or how many responses in a gospel meeting. I don't have to keep up with those because the moment that I uttered the gospel of Jesus, I was successful. But we have to do that. We can't shun away from that. We must be people that we convict others of sin and ourselves sometimes. Apply that great flashlight upon ourselves. Seventh, I mean the lesson is yours. In this great sermon, we see that Peter presented a plan for men to be saved. And there may be somebody that disagrees with me tonight. As my good friend Eddie Kraft used to say, that's okay, you can be wrong if you want to be. It is my firm belief. And I can remember this quote. Brother Winkler said, Why do you, somebody asked him, Why do you still present the plan of salvation? And his answer was, I believe that every man ought to hear it at least once. And if I have the opportunity to say it, I'm going to present it. It has become a novel thing, at least in my experience, as I, and I guess maybe I'm getting old. I, I, I get annoyed at some things more than I used to. But I hear young preachers say, oh, the plan of salvation, we, people just don't listen to that anymore. They, they just pick up their song books and they're just ready to sing the invitation song when the preacher starts offering the plan of salvation. My question is this. If it is my purpose to take the Word of God, and the Word of God, its purpose is to show that man has a sin problem and God has the only solution to that sin in the person of Jesus Christ and the Gospel. If that's what the Word of God is about, and it is, that's what it's about then don't you think that those who stand up, who propose themselves to be preachers of the Gospel, who propose to tell other people about Jesus, don't you think they've missed out on something where they don't tell other people how to come to Jesus? In my, in my opinion, and this is going to sound harsh, but that is one of the most ridiculous propositions I've ever heard. And some of these young men are smart young men. They're intelligent young men. They're fantastic speakers. I believe they love God. But they're wrong when they say that we need to just 
throw the plan of salvation out because it's old and outdated. Those men said, it's always my concern that as I preach the Gospel that someone within themselves or maybe even out loud is going to say, well, what do I need to do to be saved? And if I sit down without telling them that, then I've not done what God has charged me to do as a preacher of the Gospel. What do you suppose would have happened when they said, what shall we do? Had Peter not given that beautiful and great answer inspired by the Spirit, how hard is it for us to tell someone? If you want your sins to be washed away, believe in Jesus, John 8, 24. Repent of your sins. Whether you want to use Luke 13, 3 and 5 or, or Acts 17, 30 and 31 or some other verse. How hard is it to tell someone that they must with their mouth confess the name of Jesus Christ? Romans 10, 9 and 10. How hard is it to tell someone that if you want to be rid of sin, you want a way to deal with it for the rest of your life, to be immersed in water, that is to be baptized, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the purpose of your sins being washed away. How hard is it for me to take the... the, the I could do it in 10 seconds maybe if I wanted to. How hard is it to do that? And what inconvenience is it? What a silly notion that it's inconvenient to tell people how to be saved. The plan was presented on the very first time the gospel was ever presented. Peter told people how they could deal with their sin. And we need preachers that that's their purpose. I've preached now by my account, somebody asked me not too long ago, how long have you been preaching? I preached the first time. I was 15 years old. We'd gone on a mission trip to Idaho. We came back and I preached for the very first time two weeks, uh, sorry, three weeks after I obeyed the gospel. 15 years old. And the Lord gave me 52 years this year. 37 years. And I can honestly say that I've never preached a gospel sermon. I've never preached one time ever without telling those that I preach to how to obey the gospel. And you can say that's my opinion. You can say I'm just old-fashioned and traditional. I look at what Peter said and I say I'm right. I hope this is something that's been helpful to you and stirred you up, made you think I'm thankful for you and the way you listen. Good evening again, everyone. It's always good when you can stand before people and say with certainty that it's been good to be here tonight. Aren't you glad you're here tonight? We just heard a great lesson on, on how preaching should be done. And not surprisingly, it came straight out of the Bible. It came straight out of the Bible. We had a, a great lesson. Uh, we've already heard the plan of salvation once. I suspect we're going to hear it again here just shortly and have the opportunity to respond to that if there's anyone here that needs to do that. We have just a few brief announcements I'd like to make. Uh, we've got several folks on our prayer list. Uh, I'd like to run down the list uh, tonight and make sure that you keep David paid in your prayers. Uh, continue to pray for Terrell as he uh, as he heals up. He's here with us tonight and has been coming to coming with us, but uh, keep him in your prayers. Also, Angela McCauley. Barbara Sintel is seeing a spine specialist on the 23rd, so please keep that in your prayers. And also, 
Marlin Cowan has been scheduled for an MRI to see about the uh, see an orthopedic surgeon about his back and hip. He's dealing with a lot of pain. So keep Marlin in your prayers. Continue to keep uh, Ruth Crow in your prayers with the pain that she's dealing with with her back and in her knee. Uh, James Moore is still in the nursing home facility in Port Oglethorpe, so please remember him. Also, Wanda Gray will be going to Nashville for her heart valve procedure August 21st and 22nd. So please remember Wanda Gray in your prayers as well. Uh, JL Sisters Edna Hudgens is home and is having uh, constant care, so please remember that, that family in your prayers as well. We'd announced a while back about a young man that was 12 years old by the name of Michael Hobbs and he was diagnosed with lymphoma. Uh, he's been taking some treatments and his last scan, Francis told me, came back clear. Came back clear. So continue to keep in your prayers. He's going to finish up his treatments, but we're thankful that he had that, that, uh, that clear scan that came back and we praise God for that. We also had announced on Sunday, Philip Bridges, a friend of Brian's, uh, was in ICU and, and had uh, diabetes and he's still having issues with that was, but was able to come home Sunday night so we're thankful for that continue to keep him in your prayers we're adding to the prayer list tonight uh, Allison Durham's Aunt Kathy uh, she has suffered a stroke and is at ICU at Erlanger so please keep Allison's Aunt Kathy in your prayers also uh, Don's out sick tonight it's unusual not to see his pretty bald head sitting over there on the one of the first few, so keep Don in your prayers as well. Don't forget this Saturday is our men's breakfast. Be here at the building at 8 a.m. Door knocking at 2 p.m. same day. Teen singing is at Riverbend in Dalton. Uh, Sunday the 13th is Sunday. Group 2 will be signing compassion cards on Sunday, August 20th. So please... Uh, Keep that in your prayers and that's an outside aisle group here plan on plan on staying after for that the folks that are going to uh polishing the pulpit we're going to get our cards on this sunday we can go ahead and fill them out and leave those with uh charlotte ann so she can get those in the mail after the group meets on the 20th there's ladies day at sublignan road church of christ on september 16th there's details about that on the bulletin board I believe I've made it through the announcement, so we have we have succeeded with that. We're thankful again for everybody's attendance. At the proper time, our closing prayer will be led by Brother Frank Centel. Our invitation will be led again by Aaron, and uh, our good brother Andre will lead us in song. I'll be reading 851, Wish God and
as we consider the invitation of the Lord every time that we come together, that's something we want to do. We want to consider our own lives. We want to encourage those who might have never obeyed the gospel to do so. As I stated just a few moments ago, that the Bible is God telling man that he has a sin problem and then telling man how it is that he can deal with that sin. I love the proverb writer because there's so many times that he, he makes straightforward statements that you know you, you hear them and you just kind of hit your head and say, well, well yeah, you know, that's right. The proverb writer talks about a lot of different things, but one of the statements that I, that I really appreciate and love is when he says in Proverbs 13, verse 15, good understanding give a favor, but the way of the transgressors is hard. Now, despite what popular culture wants us to think about living a life of sin and living a life of, uh, of revelry and living a life of, of rebellion against God, and, look, and they present it as being something that's fun and it's something that's enriching and, and, and you're doing what you want to do and you're getting what you want to get when, while you can get it. The proverb writer says, paints a different picture altogether. He says, the way of the transgressor is hard. And any one of us who's ever been caught in that place where our conscience is convinced that what we are doing is wrong, that the way we're thinking is wrong, something we've done is wrong, the way we're living is wrong, all of us, I believe, would say a hearty amen to, under, to, to the understanding that the way of sin is a hard way to live. You know, a lot of times we present it the other way around. We say, oh, well, the Christian life is so hard to live. It's, it's, so, it's so difficult. It's so hard. But that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say that it's easy, but it doesn't say that it's the most difficult thing to do. But living the life of a transgressor is hard. If you're a liar, it's hard to remember who you lied to and what lie you told. If you're sorry so-and-so that you just don't care what you do with your body, there's shame that's brought with that. There's, there's plenty of statistics that will tell you that and they will tell you that. What we put into our bodies and how we shame ourselves, and I could go on and on and on, that's a hard way to live. It's difficult to bear that burden when you realize what it's doing to you and doing to those around you. The way of the transgressor is hard. And because the way of the transgressor, not only the way, but the end of the transgressor is hard. Destruction. Death. Eternal. Separation from God. And so the invitation is that which tells us how we can deal with the burden of sin. That's what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 11. These, verse, these words you know, we've sang them. We sing them, we study them, we talk about them. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. That's the way of the transgressor. That's the hard way of the transgressor. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I'll give you rest. Jesus is not talking about being re resting from your job. The hard job you had or, or your kids that, that are wearing you out or whatever it is. That's not what Jesus is not offering rest from that. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden with sin, and I'll give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And if you take if you take Jesus and you learn Jesus and you allow him to be your master, then he says, you'll find rest unto your soul. For my yoke, listen to what he says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. The way of the transgressor is hard. And if you're living that life right now, if you're living your life separated from God by sin, you're being weighed down by the care of this world, by the way of this world, you can deal with that. You don't have to leave this place tonight with that same burden. Because Jesus says, if you come to Him, and we've, we've presented the, the plan of salvation already one time, but if you will, simply do what Jesus said. If you will believe that He is 
who He says He is. John 8, 24, He said, if you don't, you'll die in your sin. The opposite of that is you'll live because of Him and because of your trust in Him. If you would repent of those things that are wrong in your life and, and not just say, I'm sorry for them and not just say, I've done wrong, but make a decision right now that sin is not going to be your way of life, but rather the righteousness found in Jesus Christ is going to be your life, is going to be what, it, what guides you and what motivates you. Jesus says, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He's telling that to people who wouldn't believe in Him, who wouldn't turn to Him. Jesus says, confess Him with your mouth. That's what He told His disciples in Matthew 10. He sent them out into the world and He said, you confess Me, and I'll paraphrase it, whosoever confessed Me before men, him will I confess before My Father which is in heaven. And then Paul said in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that it is with the mouth that confession is made towards salvation. Would you be then immersed in water? Jesus said so in Mark 16 and verse 16. You know that verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved in every instance from there forward of anyone having their sins dealt with it was done so it culminated in what we call the watery grave of baptism. Paul said when we do that, we rise to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 1-6, through 6, wherein we can live faithfully. We can live faithful to the end of our life and just like Jesus promised those who were being persecuted in Revelation 2, that they would receive a crown of life. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you've never laid the burden of sin down, whatever is holding you back, whatever is dragging you down, you can leave here if you'll obey the gospel tonight. You can leave here with all those sins washed away and you can have a remedy for sin for the rest of your life. And one day you'll be able to stand before Jesus and you'll be able to hear those beautiful words, Come, you bless my Father. Enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of you need to come back to Him. You've left Him. Come back to Him. There's the people sitting here want to pray with you. They want to pray for you. They want you to be whole. And more than that, there's a Father in Heaven waiting on you that is just and faithful to forgive. First John 1, verse 9. You need to come do it while we stand in the Come in our Lord. Two other announcements before we pray. One, if you don't mind, after we have prayer, 
sat down, Ken got something he wants to tell us. And another another announcement I've got. The elders met with uh, Reed Perry about helping David out when uh, he needs someone to fill in for it. And so what what we need from you is to let us know what you think about Reed. Just give us some feedback about Reed Perry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for every blessing of life. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to meet and discuss the, your word. Bless us as we serve you. Help us always put you first in our lives. Help us to make wise decisions. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help the others to make wise decisions as we discuss the work of the church. Bless us in everything we do. Be pleased in your sight. Forgive us. Bless those that are hurting, those that have been mentioned in that, that are, are sick, or afflicted. Help us to sit there. Be of service to those that need our help. Forgive us. Christ's name. Amen.